Hey folks, in lab this week we are going to look at abstract classes and the idea of polymorphism. Um, all right, so there's a couple of interesting topics there which are dealing with circumstances where you want a class that captures a concept, but it isn't something that you would ever really make in the real world. Um, this is useful sometimes when you're coming up with a um, the definition of a set of classes. You might have a class that theoretically needs to exist because there's a bunch of children that have it in common, but you wouldn't really make it. It's generally the idea of an abstract or a, a, um, a general idea rather than a specific idea. So that's what an abstract class is. We're also going to talk about polymorphism, which is the ability for one thing to behave and look like something else. So I'm going to come back to where we were last week. Um, this is the same um, code that I wrote last week, which was we had the um, person class, which here has a name and an age and a daily routine. And then we have underneath it student, which is um, inheriting from person and has a KSUID, a major, and also a constructor and an override for the daily routine. Undergrad, which is a child of parent, but has nothing in it. And then we had employee, which is a child of student, which also has pretty much nothing in it other than an ID. And we drew a UML diagram of this, so this has all of that information on it. So the thing that I'm going to do today is I'm going to talk a little bit about the idea that a student is a real thing. You guys are students. Employees are real things. I'm an employee. You can argue that an undergrad versus a grad student is a real thing. So let's go ahead and add in grad students, so new class. So grad student, and I'm going to just have that one also extend student. Extends student, there we go. All right, and so immediately over on my, um, on my diagram here, we're going to see that I now have grad student, and I am going to have to move these around again just a little bit. I'm going to pull these off to the side because they don't really matter too much for me, and the main method doesn't really matter too much either. But now I have um, person, which has... Um, student, which then has undergrad and grad. Okay, so that's a bit more understandable. All right, so that's great. All of these things exist. I'm an example of this. You're an example of that. You're an example of one of these, probably this. But is there an example of a person? Like, what is a person? It seems like that's an abstract idea. It's not really, I don't, you don't, in, you don't have real Okay, you do have real people, but you don't really instantiate person. You would either instantiate a student or an employee. If we're talking about all the people at KSU, then there is an employee, there is a student, but there's really not anything else that's at KSU. I guess you might have a visitor or something else, but in general, this is an abstract idea. It's, it's there because we all share name and we all share age and we all share some other things, so it makes sense to have a class that's the parent that has all that information in it, but you may not want people to actually instantiate that class. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over to my person, which is that public class person, and I'm going to change it to public abstract class person. All right, so the only thing that I did was I made it abstract. Once I make it abstract, I'm immediately getting an error, and that's because over in my main method, if we remember correctly, I created a person, it happened right here. And I'm not allowed to do that anymore now that um, the person is abstract. So very specifically, I have to comment out the instantiation of that and also calling anything directly on that. But now everything works the way that it used to work. And so I'm getting the output that I used to get before. I get the students wake up and study and go to class, but I have made class non-instantiable. So, Let's just talk about what happens if I do try to instantiate it. So I'm going to uncomment that out. You can immediately see it underlined it, and it says make person not abstract um, because it cannot be instantiated as it currently sits. And if I attempt to compile, I'm just going to get that same error message. Um, so you might say, well, then why would you ever do this? Because it's just stopping you from being able to do that. Well, in a video game, let's take for example, you might have the concept of the bad guys in the game. So let's imagine it's a first-person shooter game where you're going to run through and kill zombies and all kinds of terrible things. So all of the bad guys will have some amount of health and some amount of hit points, 
and maybe some information about how often they spawn in the game and where they tend to appear in the game. So there's a bunch of information that's true about all bad guys. So therefore, you might have a class called bad guys. And then underneath it, you have zombies and robots and whatever other types of bad guys you might have in the class. And each of those children has their own definitions for how they attack and how much life and force they have and what weapons they have and all of that kind of stuff. All of that is local in each of them. But the overarching idea of a bad guy, a lot of the definitions are up in bad guy. So as the game is playing and you walk into a new room, it's going to have to create the bad guys. But it's not going to create a bad guy, it's going to create a zombie, or it's going to create a monster, or it's going to create a robot, or whatever of the different kinds of bad guys. So you would say bad guys is an abstract thought. It's not something that can actually be created, but you want a parent that holds all of the bad guys in it. And that's really what I've done here. I've made the person class abstract such that I can put stuff in there and all of the children will inherit it, but I don't have to, I don't want people to ever create person or create bad guy because that doesn't make any sense in the real world. So I'm preventing it. And again, why would I make this if I'm going to be the one creating it? Doesn't make a whole lot of sense. You have to bear in mind when you go work at a company, let's imagine you work at a video game company, you are not the only developer. There are probably 50 or 100 developers. And so the manager or the person who is running one area, the bad guy area, the bad guy department, they're going to define these abstract classes and set all the things that all the bad guys need to have in the parent. And then you would be coding the individual good bad guys that are showing up, the individual classes for the robots or the zombies or whatever it is that's going to show up in the game. And so it's a way for all of you to have the same abilities that you're inheriting from the parent without being able to accidentally create a parent, um, a zombie, a bad guy, or whatever it may be. And of course, there can be many layers of this. So you could have an abstract class that's bad guy, and then you could have flying bad guys and walking bad guys, or you could have crawling bad guys. You could have bad guys who appear at night, bad guys who appear in the day, which may also be abstract classes. So you could have bad guy, which is an abstract class, nighttime bad guy, which is an abstract class, and then bats, which is a concrete class underneath nighttime bad guy, and so on and so on and so on. So it's a way of organizing information and making it such that you can put things in a parent without having to rewrite it over and over again in the children, because otherwise every child would have to write their own version of how the bad guy dies. And the truth is that should be the same for all the bad guys. So it makes sense to write that in the parent and let it be inherited by all of the children so that they don't have to write it by themselves and possibly produce errors and bugs in the game. Okay, so that's the idea of an abstract class. Um, as far as the UML diagram is concerned, um, when a class is abstract, you notice that it went ahead and changed it into italics just so that it, it appears slightly differently. That's really the only thing that changed there. Um, all the rest of the information in here still stays the same with regard to the UML diagram. Everything is still pretty much the way it used to be. All right, so that's the UML diagram. All right, so the next topic that we're going to talk about is polymorphism. So polymorphism comes about because of the fact that you can have these trees of classes that are related to each other. And sometimes it's useful to be able to have a collection of things that may all be related. Let's take the example of KSU. So in our main method, I created one student, but we know there's more than one student here. As a matter of fact, there's a lot of you guys, I think about 45,000 of you. And then there's a lot of employees. There's about 5,000 employees here. So what if I wanted to store information about every person who's at KSU? I needed to know their name and their age and all of that stuff. How would I go about storing that? Well, I'm certainly not gonna create an S1, S2, S3, S49,998, S4, yeah, that doesn't make any sense. So what I would like to be able to do is to create an array of students. And I certainly could do that. I can say student, my student, or KSU students, equals new student 45,000. Uh, I think that was 450,000, but anyway, there we go, 45,000. So that creates for me an array of students. Then I would need an array of employees. So employee, KSU employees, equals new employee, 
has about 5,000 of us. That works, but it's a bit clumsy because these two things are really directly related. They're all KSU entities. <laughs> we are entities. So it would be nice if I could create an array of both students and employees. And it turns out I can. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a person array and I'm going to call it KSU all. And I'm going to make this 50,000. Okay, so let's talk about this for a moment. I've used person as the type, but person is an abstract class. It's a concept. It's not something that can be instantiated. So am I allowed to make a array of person? And the answer is yes. You can see that this worked quite well. It has no problems. Um, so what does that do for me? So what can I put into this array? Well, the crazy thing is I can say student s2 equals new student. And then I can say s2.name is equal to Paula. And then I can say person, or sorry, ksu all, which is the name of my array, at position 0 equals s2. So I have put student number 2 into cell 0 of that ksu array. Now let me make an employee. Employee um, e1 equals new employee. And I'm now going to say e1.name is equal to enda. All right, and now I'm going to put enda into cell 2. KSU all at position 1 is equal to E1. So the cool thing is I now have an array that the first cell is holding a student and the second cell, second cell is holding an employee. And I can mix and match all the way down the array. I can add students and employees into the array. This isn't limited to arrays. I could have done this with an array list. So I could have said array list, and that probably would have made more sense of person um, all KSU array list <laughs> is equal to new array list of person. And in order to do that, of course, I have to import, well, actually did it for me, import Java util array list. It's right up there. So now I have an array list that I can add people to and remove using the add methods and the remove methods, and it can grow and shrink as the university grows and shrinks. At the end of every semester, a bunch of people graduate, they go away, new people will come in, and it grows back up again. And so this is the idea of polymorphism, where I'm able to take one thing, which is an array list, and store in it multiple different types that are related. I can't do this for completely disparate things. So if in my list of things over here, I add, let's say, a new class that is dog, and I don't make it a child of anything else, it's just its own thing. If I come back to main, I certainly cannot add a dog into that array list. Dog d1 equals new dog. Great, I can create the dog, that's not a problem. But I cannot say ksu all at position 2 equals d1. That doesn't work, because dog is not a child of person. So in order for polymorphism to work, which is what's happening here, the parent, which is what's being used for the array list, can hold itself. I can put persons in there if I was able to instantiate a person, but I'm not because they're abstract. And I can put students in there and employees in there all without problem. I cannot put anything that's unrelated in there because that doesn't make any sense. All right, so that's the idea of polymorphism. It's not limited to just array lists. You can also do this in general with classes. I can create instances of a class, which the type of the class, for example, I can say person uh, s3 is equal to a new student. That's allowed because what I'm creating is a student, and I'm putting it on a variable that is of type person. The person is the parent, and I can create a variable of that type, goodness, um, but I'm allowed to store the child on top of that because the child is a child. So person S3 could hold a new student, it could hold a new undergrad, it could hold a new grad, it could hold a new employee, but it cannot hold a new dog because that one, again, is unrelated. So hopefully that makes sense. So today's lecture was about abstract classes and it was about polymorphism. And again, 
using the UML diagram makes it a little bit easier for you to see how all of those things are related and how you can go about using them. So hopefully that gets you started on today's lab, and I will see you guys next week.